Good evening, everyone. This is David DeSmith from Southworth Marketing. Thanks for joining us uh, tonight for another one of our author series uh, events. Uh, tonight, we are delighted to be joined by Steve Eubanks. Uh, Steve is a New York Times bestselling author uh, who's written more than 30 books. Um, he's also a very active journalist whose work has appeared in just about every golf or sports magazine you could care to name. Uh, some of his books uh, include uh, Golf Freak, One Man's Quest to Play as Many Rounds of Golf as Possible for Free, which I love that idea. Uh, another one was called All American, Two Young Men, uh, The Army Navy Game and The War. Uh, what was it? The War? You tell me, Steve. I can't read it. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, the, the the 2001 Army Navy game and uh, the war they fought in Iraq. So it was uh, following those guys right. for 10 years after they after their uh, college careers. Got it. Perfect. Um, and tonight, Steve's going to be reading from um, a, a terrific book called To Win and Die in Dixie, The Birth of the Modern Golf Swing and the Mysterious Death of Its Creator, uh, which has um, got a, just a fascinating story behind it. So. Steve, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, I've lost your video again, it looks like. I don't know if anyone else can see it. There you are. But um, Steve, thanks so much for spending some time with us. Can you hear me? Sure can, take it away. Okay, thank, hey, David, thank you so much for that, that kind introduction. I'm not, uh, not sure, not sure how, how worthy I am of that, but I appreciate everybody that's, uh, that's attending. We will open up for uh, for questions a little bit later on. Um, as David said, the um, uh, the book I, I kind of want to talk, uh, want to read a little bit about tonight. I'll, I'll hold it up here so everybody can see it. Uh, it's called "To Win and Die in Dixie," and uh, th there's a th this is a true story. Um, it is a story that I was able to uh, to dig out of the archives, and um, I, after I read a little bit of it, I'll tell you a little bit about. How I found this and uh, and and what uh, what the outcome was. So um, if you don't mind, I'll just jump right in. This was uh, August 8, 1921, a few minutes before midnight. Newspapering was a young man's game. At least that's what Comer Howe told himself as he rolled his shoulders, put one foot on the running board, and unlatched the door of his Type 59 Cadillac. It was an odd and incongruous thought, given that Comer was barely out of his teens, flushed with promise. He'd already studied abroad at Oxford and was only a few credits shy of a degree from the University of Georgia. But the pangs of another exhausting day were reporting the news to the Atlanta Constitution, coupled with the suffocating heat of a Georgia summer night, had zapped his vigor and left him feeling much older than his years. With a tall, lean physique, chiseled jaw, perfectly slicked hair, he bore a remarkable resemblance to California's latest moving picture sensation, an Italian named Rudolph Valentino. But Comer was no Latin lover and certainly no play actor. With his chin high, his watch chain dangling from a vest pocket, just so, the fingers of a hand relaxed in the pockets of his trouser. Comer looked like what he was, one of the North Siders, the proper Atlantans who lived in large neoclassical Tudor Jacobian or colonial or revival homes along the wooded northern hills of the South's fastest growing city. Atlanta had geographical as well as social demarcations. The hilly north side of town where oaks, magnolias, and dogwoods shaded manicured lawns was the province of all the right families, many wealthy, all white. The pine-laden flatlands grew progressively darker. The east side of town housed clusters of Japanese and Chinese who had migrated to the region as agricultural and railroad workers. And the Southern enclaves were majority Negro areas someone like Homer Howell rarely visited and never at this time of night. He had removed his four button jacket, a staple of the sack suit, but too hot for August, even at midnight. And he'd loosened his silk tie, removing the clip and unfastening the collar of his white shirt, a faux pas bordering on scandalous in a town where Edwardian mores required professional men to change clothes several times a day, depending on the activity. Comer's father certainly would have frowned on his casual appearance, but the elder Howell would just have to understand. 
The thought of explaining his present wardrobe to anyone, especially his father, caused Comer's shoulders to slump. He worked at the family newspaper, lived under his father's roof, one of the largest Victorian dwellings on the north side, in the warm comfort of family largesse. But with those trappings came the heft of the Howell name. Maybe it was just the lateness of the hour, with Monday about to slip into Tuesday and his eyes burning from cigarette smoke and the stain of putting another day's newspaper to bed. Comer couldn't wait to get his car rolling uptown. Cadillac was one of the first automobiles with a venting system, blew air directly into the passenger compartment, and the Type 59, with its innovative tilted windshield, provided as comfortable an experience as one could find on the road. By all rights, he was too young to be driving a luxury automobile, especially at a time when most jo Georgians still owned horses, or at least a mule. But along with the responsibilities of upholding the family reputation, being a Howell in Atlanta carried certain perks. Comer refused to feel guilty for indulging a few extravagances. Of course, if he were such a big deal, why was he leaving the office at this hour, especially after going to press with such burning stories as the one about an 80-year-old Atlantan who'd fallen from his ladder in his front yard? He opened the door and waited on the running board while his passengers plopped into their seats. No matter the hour, Homer would never breach his Southern manners by sitting down before his guests. Lloyd Wilhope, the city editor, was the first. He was a crusty authoritarian man whose perpetual frown blended with his cheeks into one fleshy crevice became indistinguishable for the next. His demeanor didn't brighten as he climbed into the back seat of Comer's car for the ride home. No one told Wilhelm to sit in the back. It was just assumed that he would want to be chauffeured. Paul Warwick, a senior reporter, and the man with enough clout at the newspaper that even Wilhelm left him alone, sat in the front. They were grizzled veterans of the news business, real reporters who ground out stories like Neil from a Stone, men who viewed Comer as a nice kid, but the boss's son, not their equal. He didn't stop them from, high, from hitching a ride after such a long night, especially since Howell had the nicest car in the newsroom. Boss's son, a moniker that could burrow a hole through the sternest of young psyches. No matter what he did or how hard he worked, Comer seemed destined to be known as Clark Howell's son. His dad had taken over as owner, editor, and publisher of the Atlanta Constitution in 1901, just a few months after Comer was born. And in the two decades since, the paper had grown into one of the most respected news organs in the nation. Of course, Comer had nothing to do with that success, which meant he had more to prove. Coworkers always looked askance at the young heir, it was common in any job but it was especially brutal in the cutthroat business like the news. As if Clark Howell's shadow were not large enough, Comer's grandfather, Captain Evan Park Howell, had been a war hero, the kind of man other men spoke of with faraway looks in their eyes. After serving in Virginia under Stonewall Jackson and leading a Confederate artillery battery during Billy Sherman's romp through Atlanta, Captain Howell had worked as the sole reporter at the Atlanta Intelligentsia. He hadn't done it for money. The family sawmill on Howell Mill Road had become a gold mine in the town Sherman torched, and it rose from the ashes. Lumber couldn't be cut fast enough, and the Howell Mill became one of the city's premier suppliers. Wealthy and a war hero, Captain Howell, known as E.P. among his friends, dabbled in law and politics, being elected state senator twice. But his true passion was the paper reporting, editing, and publishing news of the New South. So in 1887, E.P. Howell bought controlling interest in the Atlanta Constitution and assumed the mantle of editor-in-chief. Comer's family controlled things ever since. Unspoken resentment hung like summer mist about Comer's two passengers that night. After all, how was a city editor and a senior reporter supposed to treat a Howell? In addition to being their boss, Comer had once been president of the state Senate and a candidate for governor. Newspapermen running for political office was quite common since the public saw them as intelligent and informed citizens, as well as some of the wealthiest. 
The man who had beaten Clark Howell in the, new, in the governor's race, Hoke Smith, had once owned the Atlanta Journal, the rival paper to the Constitution. While Comer never lived in the governor's mansion, never ran anything more complicated than a weekly bridge game, he did live a life most reporters could not fathom. He wore black patent leather shoes to work, two-tone wingtips, and his casual attire at the time when many Georgians went shoeless. He also owned brogues with fringed tongues for the occasional retreat to Augusta, Thomasville, or Jekyll Island Club. His tuxedo, $50 extravagance, had been custom tailored in New York along with several of his golf coats and knickerbockers. He didn't play much golf, but he kept the clothes on hand in case he got called for a game at Brookhaven or the Atlanta Athletic Club at Eastlake, clubs his family had belonged to from their inception. Comer went to all the right parties, his acquaintances, romances, and otherwise were esteemed Southerners. His accent was just so, proper Victorian grammar, delivered in an adazio rhythm with the R's rolled into Oz. Nothing like the banjo twanging phrases of the hillbillies or the guttural vowel swallowing of the field hands. He was the consummate gentleman. Even his name reeked of status, Hugh M. Comer Howell, his father's, fam his father's family name, plus the full name of his maternal grandfather, who was himself the fam famous late president of the Georgia Central Railroad. Little wonder other reporters at the paper had trouble warming up to him. Comer worked as hard as anyone, staying late, taking piddling assignments, pecking out tight bylines about the socialites' weddings, Officiating the service was the honorable reverend, or listening to endless blather on city council. Today's inanity had included paragraph upon paragraph about traffic safety. The Junior Chamber of Commerce had declared the second week of August as Traffic Safety Awareness Week in an attempt to draw attention to the maimings and deaths on the city streets. There's no doubt a worthwhile cause, According to the New York Times, one person was killed by a car every 42 minutes in America, an epidemic that showed no signs of abating. Unfortunately, by 11 o'clock on a Monday night, Comer couldn't care less. He was hot and exhausted, longing for nothing more than a few hours alone in his Chippendale walnut bed. He would decide how to respond to the contempt he sentenced from Will Holt Moore tomorrow, fair or not. Nepotism always left a stain. To combat it, Comer, Comer had to become the best reporter in the city. He needed nitty gritty newspapering, something that would make Comer Howell the talk of the town for his efforts and not his name. Right now, though, he needed sleep. A dark, quiet house awaited him on Wesley Avenue, and he had a darn nice motor car to transport him there. Emerald green with sturdy arched grill, sleek carved running boards, and 12 spoke wheels. A machine worth more than most people at the paper made in a year, a point no one mentioned, but another source of unspoken tension among his passengers. Conversation was light. They were too tired and the night was too hot for chit chat. August was always the most oppressive month. But this one had been especially stifling and nightfall brought no relief. The air felt like molasses and the smells of sawdust and tar the aroma of progress, as politicians called it, were enough to turn the stomach. Once they got rolling, the breeze cooled things down a bit. But that all changed as they rolled through the 500 block of West Peachtree Street. Will Holt saw it first. Comer stopped the car, a man in the road, he shouted. Jerking the wheel toward the center of the street, Comer hit the brakes and the car wobbled to a stop. Thankfully, there was no traffic. Comer whipped the car around it. Fifth Street intersection. Then he saw it too, a motionless figure face down near the curb, legs sprawled, and a head cocked at a strange angle near the gutter. At first, Comer thought it was a scarecrow or one of those mannequins that Gavins used to display their $13 men's suits. But as the headlights hit the figure, Comer saw the puddle, black and glistening. It was a man, there could be no mistake. He wore cuffed trousers and a white shirt and lay in a pool of blood. They froze. As much as Comer, Wilhelm, and Warwick believed in themselves to be noble men of courageous stock, nobody felt compelled to rush forward. 
the climb from the Cadillac slowly, haltingly. When a streetcar approached, they clambered over each other in an attempt to flag it down. There weren't any passengers at midnight, so Wilbur convinced the two conductors to help. Together, the five men inched toward the figure in the street, each fighting the urge to flee the scene as blood oozed from the lower extremities. He's still breathing, one of the streetcar conductors said. The news jolted Wilholt into action. He ran to a house on the other side of the street, the only one on West Peachtree with the lights on at that time of night. I need to telephone an ambulance, he shouted. Comer felt like his heart was going to leap from his chest, but his legs seemed paralyzed. He couldn't look away from the blood as it shimmered in the glow of the new white way street lamps the city had installed. The orbs, five bulbs per pole, gave the glowing pool a glistening sheen. Comer knew he couldn't stand there while this waxy looking man expelled his last breath. The figure appeared so unnatural, like a mime or an actor in makeup. When Comer finally moved, <clears throat> he slipped, only then realizing the blood had enveloped his feet. Comer leapt to the sidewalk, his breath shallow. He sprinted to the nearest boarding house, opened the screen door and banged on the door. Let me use your telephone. A man has been hit by a car. Why he used those words wouldn't occur to him for some time. Comer had no idea what had happened in the street. Nobody did. But Traffic Safety Awareness Week continued to weave through his subconscious. Comer had learned a lot about auto accidents in the last two days, like the fact that so far in 1921, 38 Atlanta souls had been called home in traffic-related incidents. The fifth highest death toll among cities of 100,000 residents or more. He also knew that cars were multiplying like rabbits. Henry Ford's Model T factory on Ponce de Leon Avenue had been churning out vehicles in Atlanta since 1915. A year after Ford came to town, the city had 6,000 automobiles chugging up and down its streets. George Hansen had added to the congestion by opening the Hansen 6 plant, calling Atlanta the logical automobile center of the great Southeast. Now there were close to 25,000 cars in town and the death toll continued to climb. Shouldn't have surprised anyone. The automobile itself was only a few years old and motor vehicle dexterity was still a generation away. Most roads hadn't been upgraded from the horse and buggy conditions and Georgians certainly weren't accustomed to fast, powerful machines on their streets. Dozens of people had died by walking in front of cars they had seen. They'd simply underestimated the closing speed of a Model T. Shouting that a man in the street had been hit by a car was a reflex, a verbal vomit in the midst of a crisis. At the time, Comer didn't give it a second thought. There were far more pressing concerns, like getting an ambulance to the scene. He had no idea how crucial his words would later become or how much he would regret having uttered them. At that moment, he just wanted to do something, anything to help. He banged on the door again, please help, we need an ambulance. Then he heard a crash, like one of the windows being blown out. What on earth? Running out front, Comer saw a young man, not much older than himself, dressed in night clothes, leaning over the body. He glanced to his right and saw that rather than come out the door, the man had simply jumped out a front window, leaving the screen in a mangled heap near the curb. The man in bedclothes fell to his knees in a sticky black pool. Undaunted by the past amount of blood, he cradled the pale head of the victim in his lap. To Comer's shock, the bleeding man was still alive and trying to speak. The bedclothes man leaned down, putting his ear almost to the man's barely moving lips. An audible whisper escaped between raspy and ever-growing breaths. Then, all movement stopped. The bleeding man died in the lap of a friend who showed no shame in weeping like a baby in the middle of the street. Who is he? Will told asked after the bedclothes man got control of himself. Edgar, the man said. Edgar who? The bedclothes man shook his head. Douglas Edgar, he said in a decidedly British accent, distinct to some region in the north of England. James Douglas Edgar. Why do I know that name? Warwick asked. The man in bloody bedclothes looked up, cocked his head, and said, because he's the greatest golfer in the world. That statement was far from hyperbole. 
For starters, the man in bedclothes was himself a professional golfer, an Englishman named Tommy Wilson, who'd come to America to serve as a apprenticeship under his mentor, Douglas Edgar. The two had known each other since Wilson was a boy. Wilson had caddied for Edgar and then become his assistant at Northumberland Golf Club in Gosford on, on the outskirts of Newcastle upon Tyne. After the war, when Edgar moved to Atlanta become, to, to become the professional at Druid Hills Golf Club, Wilson had followed him. It was no surprise that Wilson held his mentor in such high esteem. The two were apparently living together, so the young man's emphatic statement about Edgar being the greatest golfer in the world could have been discounted. But Wilson was not alone in that opinion. In the small but vibrant universe of golfers, J. Douglas Edgar was generally acknowledged as one of the finest players in the game, mentioned as the favorite in almost every tournament he entered, and often being photographed for pre-tournament publicity as one of the leading contenders no matter how important the event. Photos of Edgar with Harry Varden and Ted Gray, two of, two of golf giants in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, littered major golf magazines, and no less an expert than Bernard Darwin, the dean of the niche profession that would later become known as golf writing, said, I watched a good deal of Edgar's play and never wished to see anything more consistently brilliant. Darwin wasn't the only scribe singing Edgar's praises. In 1920, Golf Illustrated Magazine, a dominant American publication at the time, rhetorically asked, did it occur to you that J. Douglas Edgar is an uncanny way of winning golf championships? And editors at the official organ of the Professional Golfers of America, precursor to the PGA Magazine, wrote, when the records for 1920 are all compiled, it will be seen that Jock Hutchison, J. Douglas Edgar, and Walter Hagen have accounted for the majority of the main events this year. Even Varden, the greatest golfer in the world at the turn of the 20th century and the only man in history to win six British Open championships, said of Edgar, this is a man who will one day be the greatest of us all. That would have been a nice compliment from anyone, but Varden rarely handed out officious accolades. During the height of his playing career, he beat half the fellow competitors through sheer intimidation, often pretending other players simply did not exist. Varden, who played against Walter Hagen and lived long enough to see Bobby Jones, Gene Saracen, and young Byron Nelson, was known to have used the word greatest in reference to only two people, Bob Jones, of whom he said, with a few more years in the game, he will be one of the greatest golfers in the world and J. Douglas Edgar. In the years that followed, others gushed about Ed, Edgar's abilities. Tommy Armour, winner of the British Open, US Open, a PGA Championship, who would become known as the Silver Scott, say he was undoubtedly the greatest of them all and taught me the most. Several of the lessons Edgar taught Armour occurred during head-to-head -head contests where Edgar thumped Armour handily. Then there was O.B. Keeler, a columnist for the Atlanta Journal who became famous as Bobby Jones's friend and personal scribe. Keeler wrote that Edgar was a strange and fascinating little man. And let me tell you, when he was right, I have never seen the golfer who could keep up step with him. Keeler never wrote a careless word. So it's safe to assume that he put Jones among those who could not keep step with a right Edgar. Even as late as 1947, Notice journalist Ray Haywood wrote in Golf Magazine that Douglas Edgar, a name known only to the older golfers, was the world's greatest golfer, amateur or professional, bar none. Edgar can't be compared shot for shot with Byron Nelson. His time was much earlier. Fortunately, perhaps for Nelson. He can be compared with Jones, however. Jones was Edgar's pupil. It was true. The greatest amateur golfer in history, Bobby Jones while struggling through his formative years as a teenager, learned from Edgar and in fact, came out of the only slump he ever experienced in his career after spending countless one-on-one -on -one hours with Edgar. Anyone with a passing interest in golf knows Bobby Jones. The same cannot be said for Douglas Edgar. However, Haywood witnessed Edgar firsthand and saw Jones win his championships. He watched Nelson, Ben Hogan, Sam Snead, 
and he put Edgar at the top of that heap. In the decades immediately following his death, Edgar was considered the father of the modern golf swing, a savant who was the first to employ many of the principles considered to be fundamental in later years. In describing his swing and the types of shots he played, Darwin, Keeler, and Grantland Rice all used the word unique, unusual, and not seen before. 90 years later, the motions Edgar prescribed can be found in almost every inst instruction book in print and his unique swing is now the model for most professionals. Edgar also coined many phrases that remain in use 90 years after his death, and he created one of the first mass-produced golf training aids, his Gate to Golf, a device that has been copied thousands of times. A contemporary sports writer named Angus Perkison wrote, Edgar knows golf, he knows he knows it, and he convinces him that he is equal to the best. Why shouldn't he feel that way, having won over Harry Varden and Ted Ray? Yet, like a photo left out in the rain, memories of J. Douglas Edgar have faded over the years. During Jones's reign as the greatest, excuse me, greatest player, and on through the early years of Byron Nelson and Gene Saracen, references to Edgar's influence were common. But by the early 1950s, he was more of an afterthought, marked mainly by the passing. Oh, remember Douglas Edgar? By the 1970s, he'd become an historical footnote, the answer to a trivia question for only the most obsessed golf aficionados. By 1980, the silver platter Edgar won for the Southeastern Regional Qualifier for the Wanamaker Championship had become the J. Douglas Edgar Trophy given to the winner of the Winter Eclectic Competition in the Golf, golf Course golf club near Northeast England, prompting many who want of the event's winners to say things like, who the devil is J. Douglas Edgar? The occasional whatever happened to article popped up every five or six years throughout the 80s and even into the early 90s. But for the most part, Edgar all but evaporated from golf's collective consciousness. By the turn of the 21st century, even officials at the USGA and PGA Tour and the Royal Lancet Golf Club at St. Andrews said, who, when asked about Edgar. But despite his rip, his slip into relative obscurity, one unassailable fact solidly solidifies Edgar's claim on history. 90 years after his death, he still held the oldest unbroken record in professional golf. I'll stop there because we are almost 30 minutes in. I, uh, I will tell you that the oldest unbroken record in professional golf, 100 years later, 101 years later, still stands. Uh, Edgar won the 1919 Canadian Open by 16 shots. Uh, the second place finisher in that event was Bobby Jones. It was Jones's first uh, national championship, and, and at, at the time, it was his highest finish in a national championship. And throughout his career, it was still his largest margin of defeat. To this day, if you go into the record books, uh, that, that record has been tied a couple of times, but it has never been broken. 16 shots remains the largest margin of victory in professional golf history. Uh, Edgar went on to win the 1920 Canadian Open back to back. He won the uh, second one in a playoff uh, against his, his pupil, Tommy Armour. He also won the uh, Southern Open that year and was the runner-up to Jock Hutchison in the PGA Championship. Um, between Hutchison, Varden, and Edgar, they were basically the top three players in the game in 1920. The other two you've heard a lot about. Hutchison uh, was the honorary starter at the Masters for many years when it first began and uh, still is, uh, he's a member of the World Golf Hall of Fame, Varden. Garden is a legend. His, uh, his grip is still taught as one of the fundamentals of the game we, we, and known as the Barden grip, even to youngsters growing up. Uh, he, he's been portrayed in movies. He's had books written about him. Edgar is a forgotten figure. If you go down to uh, Ponte Vedra right now and ask half the staff about uh, Douglas Edgar, not a, not a one of them is going to know who you're talking about, uh, even after the publication of this book. It's, uh, it, it's an extraordinary 
thing. History is an extraordinary thing in that a uh, hundred years after someone's death, it's uh, it's difficult to keep up with them, especially a death as uh, as gruesome and mysterious as the one that um, that Edgar suffered. He was um, he was an odd man, but he was a great player. Um, and this, it was fun to be able to dive into this for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, doing research on something like this, where you dive into hundred year old newspapers and firsthand accounts and go into archives and find written notes and find uh, investigative reports and, uh, and all kinds of, uh, things from the Atlanta police department and from back libraries and ancient family histories. Um, it, it really is an eye-opening experience, particularly when you read some of the prose, some of the language that was used. It was jarring. And then when you look at some of the, um, some of the things in, in historical context that took place back in that day, um, you know, the, these guys were stomping around on a crime scene, having no idea they were contaminating evidence because there was just no way, no evidence to gather uh, investigative techniques in that, uh, in that time. Had, had advanced very little since the, the Middle Ages. Um, so other than interviewing potential witnesses, there was not a whole lot that could be done. But uh, Comer Howell, our uh, reporter who we have met, um, would never let it go. He felt, uh, he felt guilty that, uh, that the police and some people in Atlanta attempted to write this off as a traffic accident. Uh, it, for starters, because they wanted it to be, uh, behold, another figure has been uh, killed in a traffic accident and we need to, uh, we need to be safe and you know, take action. Uh, but the second reason was uh, it, to, to assume otherwise would have proven to be nefarious conduct, which this clearly was. Uh, and as you get further into the book, you realize that, uh, that Douglas Edwards was murdered on the street. And, uh, then, and it was up to Comer Howell to not only prove that fact, uh, but to come to some conclusion as to why. Uh, it was fun to be able to uh, take modern day forensic techniques and move them into um, uh, a century year old unsolved case. Uh, the case remains unsolved, by the way. It's still, an it's still considered an open case a century later, although no one but me has touched the file in over 60 years. Um, but it was also it was also fun to be able to um, uh, to to go into the mind of someone who was there at the time, not just because of the things that they were trying to pull together, but because of the environment in which they lived. I mean, this was a this was the son of a very wealthy um, industrial magnet in the in the area, a man who you know, by all rights probably should have been governor and was certainly considered one of the uh, the top five citizens of the South at the time. Uh, in fact, the Howell family uh, was a model that uh, one of their their uh, reporters uh, ended up using when uh, when she would went quit the newspaper to uh, to go into uh, literature, um, and that was Margaret Mitchell. Uh, Peggy was a family friend of the Howells, and um, when she wrote "Gone with the Wind," many of the anecdotes that uh, that she used in there were based on experiences. Uh, from the Howell family, so uh, it, it, this was a this was a very well-to-do family that uh, that could have simply walked away and and uh, had nothing to do with uh, with the investigation, but Comer wouldn't let it go. And uh, to his credit, he uh, he stepped up and and uh, kept this case alive when too many people wanted it to close down. Um, the the funny part about this is, like most people. I had no idea who Douglas Edgar was. I had befriended uh, an old Atlanta uh, journalist named Furman Bisher. Uh, anyone who is familiar with, with golf writing, particularly golf writing in the South, may have come across that name. And if you haven't, please go read some of Furman's uh, past writings. He was, um, uh, when he died at, I believe, age 96, um, he was still writing away. He couldn't he, uh, I had visited him the week before he passed, and he was so looking forward to going to the Players' Championship so that he could spend time uh, with Rory McIlroy. Uh, but this is a guy who, who saw Gene Tunney fight. Uh, this is a guy who saw Cy Young pitch uh, as a youngster. Um, this, he, he, was, he saw all of Tiger Woods' Triple Crown uh, majors. Uh, saw him win four majors in a row. 
Uh, he had gone to, I believe, 55 consecutive masters um, and had uh, had served in Midway during World War II. Uh, a true uh, a, a true Renaissance man, a true, uh, uh, as newspaper men go, there were none harder, but there were also none better. Uh, I, would, uh, I would highly recommend going to read some of this stuff. But in his 90s, I mean, he was still insisting on going out and walking around golf courses at various championships. And so... I would go out and walk with him because I wanted to make sure he was okay. Um, and as we walked around, one day he happened to get the PGA Tour media guide. And he opened it up and said, ah, Douglas Edgar's record's still intact. And I said, okay, Furman, I'll bite. Who is Douglas Edgar? And he, he said, uh, oh, uh, Doug Edgar still holds the uh, oldest unbroken record in professional golfing. Won the 1919 Canadian Open by 16 shots over Bob Jones, and he tells me the, the whole story. And as he gets to the part about him being uh, killed on West Peachtree Street in 21, my, my leg starts to shake. And, and I said, um, you know, Furman, there, there might be a book here. Furman was like, ah, nobody, nobody wants to read that story. I've already written that story. I said, well, Furman, when did you write it? He said, I wrote it for the paper in 1966. And I'm like, well, from in there are a few people who might have missed it. So um, if you don't mind, I would like to, uh, I'd like to tackle it. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, come by the house. I'll, I've still got some notes. I'll give you all my notes. So, um, so I go by his house. And uh, the, the great thing about having a friend in his 90s who was in the newspaper business is those kind of people never threw anything away. He had his entire basement full of stuff. Uh, every credential from every event he'd ever been to, every note he'd ever taken, every piece he'd ever written. Um, so he digs, he actually pulls out an old uh, cardboard mailbox and uh, opens it up. And it's it's all of this information about Edgar, starting with interviews that he has conducted with Jones, with Armour, uh, with, with uh, Tommy Wilson, who was the assistant at the time. So... <laughs> It was it was a great jumping off point on which to, to take this. From there, I flew to England, spent time in uh, at Northumberland Club in Newcastle, um, interviewed uh, grandchildren, and and as it always turns out in the family, it was, um, Edgar's son didn't keep anything, uh, but his daughter kept everything, and so his daughter's children who were still alive. Uh, still had all of the old letters uh, between the, the mom, between Edgar and his wife, uh, all the old notes, all the old newspaper clippings from that era. Um, it, it was it was tremendous to be able to, to dive through all that family photographs, great stuff. So but from there, I mean, it was uh, then going to the police department. Um, so and, and there's really you can't imagine the look when you go into the Atlanta Police Department and tell them you would like to see the files from a 100 year old murder case. Um, so you're taken back into the, the deep archives to find out what was in there. But the great thing about this, Coleman Howell took notes. Uh, being being in the newspaper business and and you know really striving to kind of carve his niche there, he wrote down everything. And so being able to go through, see his notes, in addition to the notes of the, uh, the, invest the investigating detective, it was, uh, was pretty exceptional to be able to go find all of that. Uh, and then it was just piecing it all together, uh, piecing it all together with the, through the Atlanta History Department, uh, the Atlanta History Center, uh, going through, as I say, all of the old newspaper clippings and books from the time, uh, just to get a sense of the period, everything else that was going on uh, surrounding this. So uh, I hope you will. Uh, I hope you'll dive into the book. I hope you. Uh, I hope you like it. I hope there's something there that um, that you learn uh, more than anything. Um, I hope you walk away with a sense of of time and place uh, and of how the uh, how people lived and how the game was uh, was viewed and played a hundred years ago. That was uh, that was my uh, my attempt in writing it that and solving a murder, which I'd never done before, which is kind of cool. But um, I hope that you I hope that you love it. Um, um, and look, I you know I, I do these sorts of things a fair amount. I don't do them virtually, uh, so it's it's different talking to a camera like this as opposed to being in front of a group where uh, you know where I can.
can see, where I can interact with you one on one. Um, but just to tell you a little bit about some of the stuff I've done and, and uh, some of the stuff that I do. Uh, as, as David had said before, I, I've written a, a fair number of books, and I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you. I mean, the number is 36 now because it makes like makes it sound like I really don't have any other life. Um, a, a good number of them, like Twin and Diane Dixie, uh, you know, are written under my byline. But I've also done uh, books that I have written for other people. I wrote Arnold Palmer's last two books. Um, you know, if you're if you're know anything about NASCAR, Jeff Gordon, the race car driver. I, I wrote his autobiography, uh, which was fascinating because uh, even though I, and I was just going to shock to you given this accent, I am from the South. Um, I, I was not a big NASCAR fan, but uh, to go spend a year with, with Jeff um, and be in the hauler and, and, you know, out in the track and out in the pits with him and, and in the garage during the week was, was really a fascinating experiment. Uh, just being able to to see the science behind what these guys do is uh, is nothing short of extraordinary. And for those of you who don't know anything about it, I mean, I, I mean, I hate to run off on this tear, but um, you know, I, look, I, I like a lot of people just kind of thought this was uh, you know a couple of mechanics with wrenches and hammers and you know cars that showed up at a racetrack and ran them every week. You show up particularly at a place like Hendrick Motorsports, which is was was the team that Jeff uh, raced for. It's like NASA. I mean, when you go in there, I mean, they have an entire department that is that is just a telemetry section, which is people hunched over computers with large computer screens all the way around the wall, looking at wind drag and, and downforce and all of the vectoring and the ratios in there. And, and you're looking at this going, this looks like they're about to launch a rocket. Um, and then there's you know, there's the fabrication plant and it, all, all of the, the engines that are put together and uh, each car when it comes out on a particular weekend has been completely assembled the week before. They have broken every car down, tested every piece of metal on it and completely reassembled it so that when it goes to a track, it's ready to go. Uh, and they send two cars to every track, one primary and one backup, and they have a car for every type of track that they that they drive. So for Jeff's car at the time, number 24, there were there were, I believe it was 21 different cars uh, that were sitting in that garage. And depending on the track they were running, those were the cars that went out. So really a fascinating thing. And, and uh, you know, I, it, it makes you appreciate the sport a lot more uh, when you're involved in something like that. Um, I love telling one funny story about it though, because you know, when you, anytime you spend a year with somebody, you get you get kind of close to them. And um, one of the um, one of the weeks we were testing in Charlotte at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. And if you don't know anything about testing, it's where the driver gets in the car, goes out, drives a couple of laps, comes in, talks to the mechanic about what the car is doing, they fiddle around with it, fix it, goes back out again, drives a couple of laps, comes in, tells them about it. So I'm standing over there on pit road after, you know, an hour of this, he's losing me and he can tell it. So he finishes up and he, he steps out and he looks at me and said, um, Hey, you want to go out for a couple of hot laps? I was like, well, yeah. So you go into the hauler and, and uh, they've got, you know, got an extra race suit there that I, I get into. And so, you know, you, you're, it, I never thought about this as I'm putting on this, this powder blue fire retardant jumpsuit and, you know, putting the thing up around my neck in case the cockpit explodes. Um, put on the fire retardant shoes and get the, get the helmet and everything ready. Um, but as I'm walking out there, I, I, I get to the car and I look at the passenger side and, and they had one car that had a little right seat, just a, you know, a tiny little right seat. Most of the race cars don't have a right seat. So, um, um, but there are no doors, There's no glass on the windows and there are no doors. So I'm looking at the window that I'm supposed to climb in and it's just above waist high. It's not very big. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not sure I can get in here, but after kind of pulling my leg up, getting in, sliding in, I plop down into that seat. And at this point, they have put this harness on my neck. It's a Hans device, head and neck restraint system. So that when they 
clip your helmet to the Hans device, it looks like shoulder pads, but you can't move your head in any direction. You may only turn your shoulders this way. So it basically, it keeps your neck from breaking if anything were to happen when you're out there. It also makes you very top heavy. Um, so I'm sitting there, I cannot move my head. These, these hands from the pit crew come in and they snap me into all of these seat belts. And then they pull me back up against the seat when they tighten those seat belts. And that is when it occurred to me that I'd made a very serious error in judgment. Because Jeff takes off on the first lap and I'm thinking, okay, this, this isn't too bad until he gets to turn one and he goes up high on that banking. And I know it doesn't, when you look at, at 18 degrees of banking, it doesn't look like much. I mean, 18 degrees, if you think about it, it's only about like that. And you're thinking, oh, that's, that's not too bad until you're on it. And when you're on it, on the high side of that bank, you just feel like you're about to tumble down uh, you know, end over end to the bottom. But he goes through turn one and then up and into turn two. And this is just a get up to speed lap. And I'm thinking, okay, hey, this isn't too bad. I mean, he's going fast, but, but, but I'm okay with this. He comes out of turn four at full speed and my brain is just going, we're dead. Because you see those seats coming at you and your brain is telling you, there's no way you can make this turn. Um, but because he's going almost 200 miles an hour. But sure enough, he gets up high in that, in that bank and, and of course he gets right next to the wall and the wall is zipping right past where my window would be if there was a window. There's not, there's this just grate there. And I'm just petrified. It was all I could do not to scream, Jeff, please slow down. But he goes all the way around for a couple of laps. And the one thing about this that people don't realize is when you go through these bank turns, you would think that it would that at that speed, you'd think it would the, the G-force would pull you to the right, but it doesn't. It pulls you down because you hit the apex of the turn and all the blood starts rushing from your head because you're on this embankment. And so we finish about three laps, and I'm just I'm feeling like I'm woozy. I feel like I might pass out. And my sweat has started pouring off of me. And we pull into the pits and I get out wobbling around. Jeff gets out and he looks at me and said, um, you know, I would have taken a higher line to turn two if we'd been going race speed. <laughs> that wasn't race speed, but it clearly wasn't. They, those guys go at, at that track, they can, they go 195 miles an hour, bumper to bumper. So anytime you tune that in and think that you're not watching athletes, uh, you most definitely are. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, you know, I, I, in working with um, with Arnold, uh, got to know him fairly well, and, and um, still consider him kind of one of the one of my mentors, one of the greatest people that uh, that I've ever been around. And I, I will say this: he, he's one of the uh, one of the only athletes that what you saw was what he was. Um, there was no difference at all between what the public saw of Arnold and what Arnold was. Um, he was gracious. Uh, he was, he was always, you were always the most important person in the room, uh, no matter what. Um, he was always interested. He was, it, to be hard of hearing, he was one of the best listeners I've ever been around. Uh, and he would always ask about your family. You would ask about your family. You'd ask about your golf game. And he had a great memory. He would remember uh, what you had told him the last time you'd had a discussion. He would ask you about that. Um, he had a great memory, except when it came to the golf shots that he had played, because I'm trying to do books with him, and uh, I'm asking him, you know, Arnold, when you when you won the Open Championship in uh, in '61, you know, what can you tell me about that? And he thinks for a minute, and he says, mm, not a whole lot. Um, and then I said, well, you won it again the next year. What can you tell me about that? And uh, and he, he did have a funny story about that one. He had um, uh, he he'd, he'd won um, by hitting a six iron out of the, out of the rough at Troon, um, and then he had won at Burkdale. And um, when he went back to Troon uh, several years later, no, excuse me, going back to Burkdale several years later, uh, he was on the 16th hole, and someone asked him, Arnold, where did you hit that six iron out of the rough? Arnold walks around in the rough, and he says. You know, I don't remember it. Tip, where was that? And Tip said it, it was about 250 miles that way, Arnold, because he had hit it. He was on the wrong golf course. 
Um, but uh, one of the best calls, uh, phone calls that I think I've ever received, I'm sitting in my office one day and the phone rings and I happen to answer it and uh, the voice says, um, oh, hey, Steve, it's Gina in Mr. Palmer's office. He's got an opening in his group on Tuesday and was wondering if you'd like to come play. <laughs> and I'm like, well, Gina, let me think about it. Yes. And I'm already booking my flight before I get off the phone with, with Gina. Um, and if there's, I'll tell you, if, if there's nothing more Im intimidating than thought of going to play golf with Arnold Palmer, uh, it's the fact that when you fly up there, you fly into the Arnold Palmer Airport in Latrobe. Uh, you, you turn out and you go, you make a left onto Arnold Palmer Drive, uh, where you get to Arnold Palmer's Latrobe Country Club. Uh, you go in you uh, to the Palmer Grill uh, and you order an Arnold Palmer while, while you're waiting for him to show up uh, to end up buying you lunch. But again, it was one of those things where he couldn't have been more gracious when he, when, when he got there. Um, he invited me into the locker room. Oh, come, I've, I've already got your locker set up. You know, I, I got you a towel in your locker room in case you need it. And, uh, you know, this is, this is Sam in the locker room. He'll take care of your shoes for you. I know, and I've got you a golf cart set up already. So as we go outside to, get a, to go to the golf cart, um, there are two of his regular uh, buddies are playing with us. And, um, but I noticed that he has his own golf cart. And I'm like, well, he is Arnold Palmer. He can have his own golf cart if he wants. But he's got two staff bags on it. And they're full. And so I just happened to go over and count the clubs. And I turned to one of the other guys who were playing with them. I said, he's playing with 44 golf clubs. And the guy said, he's taking some out. He normally plays with 60. Uh, he was the consummate tinkerer. And uh, I mean, when he had to go to 14 club, it was like he was playing with one uh, because he would have entire full sets. Callaway would just send him stuff and it would end up in the bag. And uh, during the course of a round, he might go out and try to bend it a little bit so that it, that, so that it performed a little different. But uh, he, was, he, was, he, was a beautiful, he was a beautiful guy. It was, uh, it was great to be around him. And, I talk, and another guy who never threw away anything. There was a barn in Latrobe that sat at the end of Latrobe Country Club, and it had every product he'd ever endorsed, every club he'd ever played with, um, every letter he'd ever written, uh, and and you would go into that thing and the, the tractor. Many of you remember the tractor that he rode in the Pennzoil ad. It was his father's tractor there at Latrobe Country Club, and um, he it it's sitting in that barn. Um, it was. Uh, it was just a fascinating thing to be around it. And, and you know, when we when uh, when we finished up, I was thinking to myself, we're walking up 18 and it's just been a tremendous day. I'm thinking, wow, how could this get any better? And Arnold puts his arm around me on the 18th green and he says, uh, why don't you come up to the house? We'll have a drink afterwards. And I'm like, well, that's how it gets better. So we he lived at the time, he lived right across the street from Latrobe. Um, and before he uh, he ended up building a new house, he still lived in the house that he and Winnie had purchased in you know, 1955 when they first got married. Uh, and it was it, it had, was one of those old L-shaped ranch houses that had the garage on one side. Uh, but he had added on to it so many so many times. I mean, it looked like an elementary school. Um, but we, you pulled in and, and he went in and, and again, it was just memorabilia everywhere. He takes me down to his basement. Uh, for those of you old enough to remember the old show, The Rifle Man with Chuck Connors, how he would come in there shooting that rifle. Arnold had the rifle, it was in the basement of his house. Um, he had, he had original, um, Charles Schultz drawings, peanuts drawings that, uh, that had been made specifically for Arnold. Uh, of Charlie Brown playing golf with Arnold. Um, just incredible stuff. But Arnold says, um, here, just hang on, I'll get a bottle of wine. So uh, he goes through his basement and he opens a door and he, and he vanishes. And you know, I'm not the best at geometry, but I was looking around going, wait a minute, that door shouldn't be there. It, it doesn't work. Um, turns out he had tunneled under his driveway 
and created his own wine cave down there. So um, that's where he kept all of his wine. Uh, it came out and poured a couple of glasses and we're sitting there drinking it. And uh, and I was, I was thinking, this is awfully good. Um, and I happened to look at the bottle and it, and, and it was about a thousand dollar bottle of wine that he brought up. And I said, Arna, please do not waste this on me. You could have brought $10 wine up and I would have never known the difference. Um, but he said, nope, you're my guest and I like it. And uh, that's how he was. And that's how he was with everybody. Uh, you'll, you'll hear thousands of stories like that one. Um, but it was, um, you know, that's mine. I'm, uh, I'm, I am and will always be a very huge fan. And I uh, will never say an unkind word about the man. So, um, so anyway, we're uh, you know we're well into this, but and I do want to uh, I want to open this up for questions. I've been talking for almost an hour nonstop, so I'm sure you're sick of hearing from me. Um, but please ask ask anything, and uh, I'll open the uh, open. I guess I open the lines up. I'm not sure how we do this. Uh, David can jump in and let me know how we how best to uh, how best to have a, a Q and A out of this. You bet, oh, by the way, I've never been shut out. So hopefully somebody will ask a question. <laughs> Absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for, for sharing all those stories. And, you know, I am just in awe of the way you painted that picture of 1920s Atlanta. Uh, you know, you can absolutely feel, you know, yourself being transported to the Deep South as you, as you introduce that story and, and what an amazing story it is. Um, we will uh, we'll, we'll open up the microphones here, and I'll start with one question, which is, you know, I know that um, you were a you know a very good collegiate golfer and a club pro for a while, and I've played golf with you, so I've seen uh, you know even as as a, the young man that you are, you still play the game very very well, uh, and have a daughter who's an outstanding uh, collegiate golfer as well. So I know uh, you understand the golf swing. Um, you know, terrifically. Um, my question is, in all your research um, into uh, Douglas Edgar, did you ever come across any uh, any inclination, any clues as to what made him uh, such a dominant player back then? You yeah. Know, what was it about that modern golf swing that he was introducing? It, it, it's funny because he, he struggled with consistency uh, for many years, but he had a hip injury. He had, he, and it was, uh, he had a, an injury into his right hip that was congenital and it would, all, it would constantly give him problems. And he just had to figure out a way to swing with this bad hip. And if you, if you go back and look at the swings of the era, particularly Barden and Ray and some of those, uh, the swing was incredibly upright and long. Uh, they, and it was almost like a ballet dance. They would get way up on their left toe, we get the club way, way up high, and it was, it was very similar to what we see now from John Daly and Bubba Watson in that their, their arms or their hands are almost directly over their head, uh, and their hips are turned almost completely to, behind the, the ball so that, the, you know, their, their butt's facing the target at the top of their backswing. That was very common uh, back in those days. Edward couldn't do that. He physically couldn't do it. So he took he he set up with his feet slightly wider than shoulder width, and took a much flatter swing where he kept his right elbow facing the ground and was on a plane much more consistent with what we might see out of Adam Scott. Um, left heel never came off the ground, which I I think if you go to a tour driving range now, um, very very few left heels will come off the ground anymore. Um, and then the first move was for the right elbow to drop down near the right side. Uh, no other, I mean, players may have done that at the time, but no one thought about it as a swing fundamental. He was the first to do so. And, uh, and as a result, it was almost instantaneous. He felt as though he couldn't miss a shot. And, and suddenly, you know, the, the, uh, the fact that it was a compact swing that never got completely to parallel, uh, the fact that there was a whip through impact, uh, the fact that there was a, a more restricted hip motion on the takeaway, those are things that you that, that have just become commonplace on tour driving ranges and have since the 1970s. Uh, the fact that he was doing it in the 19 teens and 20s uh, is just a testament to how innovative he was at the time. 
Well, that's fascinating. Great stuff. Um, let's uh, let's open it up to any any questions that our our attendees may have. Anybody have a question for Steve? Well, I'll I'll throw in one one quick one then. Um, you know, Steve, we had talked the other day about um, your coverage of the LPGA tour. You're spending a lot of your time now out yeah. covering uh, the the uh, the women's players, and you had some interesting thoughts about um, about that tour and uh, how much you enjoy being around that tour. And I wonder if you could share some of those impressions with uh, our listeners and viewers. Yeah, I mean, I. I covered the LPGA because I was given my choice. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, the day the, uh, the PGA tour started having entourages and when you had to go through three layers of people to get to a player, uh, was the day it kind of stopped being fun. Um, and the LPGA is the way the uh, PGA tour was, um, uh, before all of that took place. And, uh, and particularly in the in the 80s and even into the the early 90s, when you could still go to dinner with a player, uh, when you could still you know, have a player's phone number and, and you know call them and tell them a joke and you know just kind of uh, go back and forth with them about various things because there was a level of there was a level of intimacy but there was also a level of trust. They knew when things were on the record and they knew when things were off the record and you did as well. And uh, that, that is now the way the LPGA is. Um, they're appreciative. Uh, they're appreciative of the fact that you're out there covering them. Uh, and, and they want to have their stories told. So, that, you know, gosh, they're, they're thanking you for your time for being out there telling their stories, uh, which is kind of a role reversal uh, given, given the, the way the, the media is treated by most professional athletes these days, and certainly a majority of the people on the PGA Tour, which is unfortunate. I mean, it really is. You you have some you have some really good guys in, in the men's professional game. I don't want to I don't want to dissuade people from believing that. Rory McIlroy might be one of the best people uh, in professional sports right now. Open, honest, you know, just gregarious. He's one. He's another one like Arnold. What you see is what you get with him. Uh, the same with Jordan Spieth. Very very fine young man. Um, but, it, you know, just the, the level of, of rigmarole that you have to go through to get to those guys uh, has become you know, just, just almost untenable. And that's not the case of the LPGA. Um, it, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, you know, I, will tell, then, I, I want to tell another NASCAR story, though, speaking of that, because I was doing a NASCAR story one time, and, and it was on Dale Jarrett. And I had gone, I'd gotten some stuff from Dale prior to the, the race, and I was going to get him again after the race because I wanted to get, you know, the, there was the pre and there was the post and the whole thing. Lap 200, he crashes. And I mean, it was one of those spectacular crashes. And I'm just like, oh my God, I mean, I don't know, I don't know if the guy's even alive. I'm certainly not going to get him after the race. So, uh, so we get, you know, we get notification. Dale's fine. He got up, he walked out of the car. He, he, going to be okay. So I'm immediately calling his, his, uh, his PR person and saying, Hey, look, can you just, can you just get one line, anything for me, uh, you know, uh, to, to finish the story up. And the guy said, uh, Oh no, he was on his way up to see you. And he's on his way up to see me. Oh yeah. Yeah. He left a few minutes ago. He knew he had to come up. So, uh, five minutes later, he was in the press box sitting down next to me saying, yeah, what else can we get? What else can I do for you? after wrecking a car going 200 miles an hour. So, uh, you know, that's that's when covering sports is fun, you know, when you run into people like that. Because, I, again, I, I don't know how many people know Dale Jarrett, but I'm going to tell that story for the rest of my life because uh, I want people to know what kind of guy he is. That's fantastic. It looks like Tim McGuire has a question. Tim, go ahead and ask. Yeah, thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, Tim McGuire from Toronto and the Abaco Club, and a bad golfer and an aspiring novelist. So I've, I've really enjoyed this. Um, you've thank talked you. about a you've talked about a bunch of characters in golf and a bunch of unusual swings and so on. Do you ever mm -hmm. have any experience with Mo Norman? Uh, you know, I, ne I, I never met Mo, but I, Mo, but I had a lot of conversations with Arnold about Mo because um, you know I just I, I was like, what was it? 
what was it about about Mo? And and uh, Arnold kind of scratched his head for a minute and he looked at me and said, "Did you ever see that movie Rain Man?" Yeah. And, uh, and I thought, okay, now I get it. That was that was kind of Mo. Um, and Arnold said we were playing one time in the um, the Baton Rouge Open, and uh, this was in the '60s and. They get to this one hole and, and there's a creek that runs across the fairway. And it's it's at like 2.30, which is right in Moe's wheelhouse. And so Arnold's sitting there thinking, well, I wonder if he's, you know, what, what club he's gonna hit to lay up. No fidgets around, looks, looks. And he pulls out driver. And Arnold's thinking, what the world is he doing? And Mo hit it on the footbridge and bounced it over the footbridge to the other side of the fairway and did it four consecutive days. He hit the footbridge every single day and bounced it back into play. So one of my best, one of, one of my favorite stories about Mo and it came from Arnold, so. Yeah, great, thank you. Sure. Steve, when you look at the players who are on the LPGA Tour now, and there are so many good ones from all over the world. Who's who's the one that you look at and say, you know, that's the next world beater from from women's golf? You know, it, it's hard to say because there have been a lot of them who've come along, and you're like, wow, you know, how how does that person miss? And and you know, they end up missing spectacularly. Um, my favorite to watch right now is Maria Fossick. Uh, she was a rookie last year as as you probably remember her from the Augusta National Women's Amateur, which she did not win. She was with Jennifer Cupcho out there. But in terms of the it factor, she has got the it factor. And um, she grew up playing with the men, uh, older brothers and men at her club. Uh, and so, and you know, they would never let her play forward. So she was always playing back with them. And so she had to learn to hit it hard. And um, she leads the tour right now in driving distance and um, has a club head speed that is uh, that's faster than Matt Kuchar and Brant Snedeker's. So um, she can flat move it out there. Um, many of her tee shots are, are in the north of 300 yards and, um, you know, she's got all the skill set. Figure out how to get her wedges a little bit closer. She's going to be a world beater. And when she does, it's going to be great for the game because she's got a personality to boot. Very cool. Are there any other questions from uh, from the audience? If not, I guess I'll I'll just ask one final question then, Steve. And the the question is, how do you think golf is going to fare emerging from this COVID nineteen lockdown that the world has been under? What what do you see in your crystal ball? Well, you know, I I didn't I, I was curious about that when it first got locked down because I was like what is the game going to end up looking like after this? And then I started going to various clubs and seeing the pent up demand. Um, my club in Georgia never closed. Uh, and year over year rounds are up 31% um, from last year because people just got to get outside. They got to get out and do something. Uh, and so they're out playing golf right now. And I know there's a huge pent up demand for any kind of competition to take place. And I think, when the PGA Tour resumes, which uh, they're still looking at uh, Colonial as the first event back, uh, it's going to get ratings like you cannot believe uh, because any live competition is going to is going to get watched um, just going away now. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm walking through the my, my clubhouse the other day and I, I hear the television on and I hear Daryl Dawkins with a pull up jumper. I'm thinking. Daryl Dawkins has been dead for decades, and they're still watching. They're watching this on television because there's nothing else to watch. So um, it, it, I, I think when when it comes back, it's going to come back incredibly strong at every level, people uh, recreationally and at the professional level. Well, let's hope that you're right about that. I think you are, Steve. And you know, thank you so much for for sharing these great stories with us and spending some time with us tonight. It's really appreciated and you know, let us know when you can come and visit one of our Southworth communities again. I know you've been to the Abaco Club and we'd love to have you come back there. But if you ever make it up north um, or over to Scotland, you know, we'd certainly love to host you. It'd be, be great to see you again. Thank you, Steve. Can't wait. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate this. Thanks for, thanks for your time.